Hi there. I'm Robin Humble, and uh, for a final practicum project, I conducted a literature re review and manuscript based upon the UVic Global Child Research Project. And the Global Child Research Project includes a group of international child rights academics working under the auspices of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child. And their mandate is to create an electronic monitoring platform that will provide um, data to governments and policymakers on public health issues related to child rights. Now, adopted in 1989, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is the most extensively ratified human rights treaty. It includes 54 articles or child rights uh, that outlines the responsibility of governments to uphold and protect these rights. Article 24 is a uh, child's right to the highest attainable standard of health, and it includes infant and neonatal mortality statistics as one of the primary indicators of a child's right to health. Now, when considering a literature review on a public health issue related to Article 24, experiences working within Indigenous communities in Canada, Namibia, and Zambia, in addition to knowledge gained through the uh, uh, indigenous health focus area brought me to the following research question. What are the impacts of colonial discriminations on a child's right to health as indicated by infant mortality and NATO, neonatal mortality statistics in a moderate and a high resource country? So this question is founded on pivotal experiences working as a registered nurse in Namibia where often a child's survival hung in a balance dependent upon the availability of life-saving resources. Now, a comparison of uh, Aboriginal children in Canada, uh, the access to life-saving resources and infant mortality statistics revealed that in some First Nations communities, the infant mortality rate, or IMR, uh, was twice that of the national rate. So a systematic search of the literature explained infant mortality statistics revealing uh, similarities and persistences of colonial discriminations as a primary determinant of health. So utilizing um, database with a lower public, uh, sorry, three databases with a lower publication date of the year 2000, 136 articles and uh, literature for the human rights community was found directly pertinent to this research question. And uh, the, the human rights international community was heavily relied upon. So a brief abstract, uh, social inequality blankets the earth and in every corner, health inequities within and between nations fall along a social gradient, and that's irrespective of the level of development of each nation. An analysis between uh, indigenous populations within a high resource and a moderate resource nation depicts inequalities in the survival of infants. So through a human rights lens of non-discrimination and a child's right to health, a comparison is drawn between Canadian and Namibian infant and neonatal mortality rates. Now, how did I come to a place of uh, a concept of colonial dis discriminations as a primary indicator? So non-discrimination is a guiding human rights principle, and it is uh, crucial to the realization of any human right. Children are especially vulnerable to discrimination due to their reliance upon adults, their growth and development, and power differentials. So the European Convention on Human Rights discusses attributes of colonialism as being uh, discriminatory and uh, structurally it is founded on racism. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples acknowledges this and uh, it necessitates the promotion and protection of Indigenous Peoples' rights. So Canada and Namibia uh, are two examples where colonial discriminations remains a determining factor of inequality of health outcomes. There's not opportunity here to divulge into specific colonial discriminations of each nation. However, perhaps these could be addressed in the question period. Um, also pertinent to this discussion is gross domestic product, or GDP. So the World Bank utilizes um, GDP as, uh, sorry, to classify the economic development and subsequent health of a country. However, GDP provides pooled national data and it does not differentiate along a social gradient or the wealth distribution of subpopulations. Uh, infant mortality statistics often receive, um, they're used as a gauge of the health of infants and their families and often utilized uh, in public health uh, program and policy development. However, like GDP, IMR uh, does not differentiate health inequalities along that social gradient or within subpopulations. 
Research has shown that even with um, larger increases of GDP, um, changes in IMR are moderate at best, and this is due to that rising inequality along that social gradient. So very briefly, moving into uh, a look at Canada. Canada, contrasting a position of global health and development, uh, Canada's poverty, income, and health inequalities are among the highest of developed wealthy nations. Now that's a baffling statement considering Canada's uh, inclusive and federally funded healthcare system. Infant and neonatal mortality statistics of Canada's 5.6% Aboriginal population is uh, inconsistent and in many cases non-existent. In some First Nations communities in British Columbia and Manitoba, respectively, IMR was found to be 2.3 and 1.9 times higher than that of the national IMR. In uh, rural First Nations and Inuit communities of northern Quebec, the IMR was found to be four times that of the national rate. So looking at Namibia briefly, Namibia has a relatively high IMR and uh, the third highest level of income inequality globally. GDP and IMR pool data again fails to differentiate between the populations, indigenous populations and uh, the 6.4% Namibians of European or settler descent. So I could find reference to, um, to a healthy and wealthy European population, however no statistical analysis could be found and Namibia does not include uh, ethnicity on its national census. So, the other issue specifically to Namibia um, is the availability and access to health services which further contributes to polarization along that social gradient. Uh, private hospitals with advanced medical treatment are available at a significant cost, otherwise state-run hospitals that uh, are typically underfunded um, are available for a, a small fee, however there is a shortage of life-saving resources in the state hospitals. So since 2006, it's important to note that the government of Namibia has created a national child survival strategy and it has a goal of ensuring 85% of mothers and infants have access to full health services. In addition, uh, the government of Namibia is committed to reducing IMR to below 20 deaths by the year 2035. So both Canadian and Namibian settler and indigenous populations remain relatively uh, polarized along a social gradient of health outcomes. This is regardless of being a majority or a minority population. How then, the question is raised, will the root of inequality be addressed if the indicators of persistent colonial privilege and discrimination are not identified and exposed? So in summary, a significant gap in the literature uh, was noted regarding the lack of comprehensive uh, statistics for infant mortality statistics for both Canada and Namibia. Um, it's also important to note, um, Gracie and King, in their discourse on global Indigenous health, they speak about, or they caution against extrapolation between Indigenous groups due to diversities. However, uh, when analyzing the IMR, persistent colonial discriminations remained the common indicator and they were precursory to inequalities, whether a minority or a majority population, and irrespective of GDP. So three main points to take forward in conclusion. First, pooled national data as an indicator of the overall health of a nation and its people, it fails to depict income and health inequality within subpopulations or along a social gradient. If health disparities are to be addressed, uh, then relative and comprehensive data is necessary. This can only be accomplished through attributes of reconciliation, strength-based and community-based participatory research. Second, what are common indicators of colonial discriminations? Through a human rights lens of non-discrimination, further inquiry is necessary. And finally, colonial discriminations and systemic biases as a primary determinant of Indigenous peoples' rights must be acknowledged by Eurocentric uh, political, social, uh, judicial and health systems. So I, although diverse nations, uh, a world apart and on opposing ends of the socioeconomic spectrum, uh, similarities are reflected through the health and survival of indigenous infants in Canada and Namibia. So great wisdom does lie in the South African and Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, where two nations continue to seek reconciliation from past and persistent colonial discriminations. And this is done through self-governance, restoration, the spirit of Ubuntu and self-determination.
and for all of your support and guidance. Thank you very much to Dr. Zebra Bagri, uh, the Global Child Indi uh, International uh, Indicator Development Team, Dr. Nigel Livingston, and Dr. Debbie Musina. Thank you very much, Robin. That was an excellent presentation. Any questions? Thanks for that. Uh, at, you know, averages this uh, concealed differences, of course. But I, what I was interested in was your reference to the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, yes. but you were looking at Namibia. Did no, does Namibia have anything about that? I was also very struck by that photograph, that pamphlet from the hospital, the one on the right-hand side of the mm -hmm. screen, that had two white kids. Yes. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, Namibia was actually colonized by Germany in the, Germany in the late 1800s and uh, experienced significant colonial discriminations, which included uh, genocide of uh, 78,000 Nama and Herero peoples through concentration camps and medical examinations very similar to what was experienced in World War II. Uh, after that time, uh, the League of Nations, which subsequently became the United Nations, actually handed Namibia over to South Africa in 1915 as a fifth province of South Africa. So the reason for including that TRC of South Africa is that um, during apartheid, Namibia was uh, the literature I found and from significant books and documentation was that uh, apartheid was implicated far greater and to a, a greater degree in Namibia than in South Africa. So when South Africa went through the TRC in 1996, they um, had asked to include Namibia in its Truth and Reconciliation Commission, recognizing that apartheid was greater implemented in Namibia. And uh, at that time, Namibia developed other Truth and Reconciliation uh, objectives. And from what I discovered, it had to do with a lot of the same uh, government officials that are still in power, or at that time were still in power during apartheid. So there was a lot of, of up higher up conflict. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the hospital. So yes, that is a private hospital in downtown Windhoek that, um, in Namibia, which uh, caters to, that was their front page on their website. And working there in the uh, state-run hospitals, you, you won't see, there is a huge disparity between race and, or what we determine as, as ethnicity, and uh, the availability of treatment to each. So that was just one prime example that was a stark realization and available. That was an amazing presentation and a horrifying one to see the, the, the similarities. Lots of positive, too. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, but my question is, um, on a personal note for you, um, I'm not sure, I, I, the UN declarations commonly, they're not legally binding. So mm -hmm. even if um, Canada is a signatory nation, they don't have any legal obligations. How do you feel that, particularly with infant mortality within indigenous populations of Canada, how do you feel that we can or do you have any ideas how we can give these declarations some teeth so that they can actually make an impact? Um, that's a great question. And uh, I think uh, through what the Global Child Research Project is specifically addressing your question. So this project is creating indicators that address the rights of children, specifically in here in Canada. And um, it creates like an indicator tool where a government can look and see where it's actually upholding child rights and where it could be doing a better job for funding, for program, for process. And uh, uh, countries are actually obligated, once they've ratified the CRC, um, to actually report to the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child. So um, that's why the committee is also interested in this, in this uh, electronic monitoring platform for future, as it actually provides a way of saying, yes, this is where we're doing great, this is where we're not doing great, and this is how we can implement program. Thank you very much. <laughs> 